Hello guys and welcome back to the 10th episode of my series about Italian presidents, where I don't just talk about the president of the Republic of Italy, but also whatever was happening in Italy at the time. Last time we talked about Oscar Luigi Scalfaro, the ferryman president that brought Italy out of Tangentopoli in the First Republic and inaugurated the Second Republic between 1992 and 1999. Today we are talking about a very influential person during Scalfaro's term that played a huge huge role in saving Italy from the economic crisis it faced in 1992. We are talking about Carlo Azzeglio Ciampi, former head of the Italian National Bank, former Prime Minister and 10th President of the Republic of Italy. Ciampi was born in Livorno in 1920. When he was 23, he crossed the border to whatever was left of the Kingdom of Italy in the south to enlist in the king's army and fight for the freedom of the nation. He also joined the Azione party, which was similar to the Republican party, though he left after a few years because the party wasn't very successful. He then graduated in literature, then in law, and after a short time being a school teacher, he decided to apply for a job at the Italian National Bank and got in to the surprise of everyone, including himself. From 1946, he worked very hard at the bank, quickly getting the hang of economics and finance until in 1979, when he became its governor. Ciampi was highly respected in his new role as head of the National Bank. One of his idols was Luigi Einaudi, and he will rule the bank following his same principles of austerity and anti-rhetoric. He never really had a good relation with the cabinets at the time. The reason for this was simple, deficit spending, sometimes that the Penta Partito was very good at. In the middle of the heaviest economic crisis Italy ever faced, Ciampi was called in by Scalfaro for an emergency meeting at the Quirinale where he was asked to make a new cabinet. That was probably the last thing Ciampi ever expected from that meeting. Gaetano Gifuni, the general secretary of the Quirinale, who was present at the meeting, will later say that at that moment he witnessed some sort of metamorphosis from Ciampi's part. He went from concerned to determined in a moment and accepted the challenge. We already talked about Ciampi's cabinet and his contributions in saving the lira. Ciampi was a true believer of the European Union and he was also very optimistic on the idea of the euro currency. After his term as PM ended in 1994 after just one year, he was Minister of Balance under D'Alema and Prodi and finally Minister of Treasure under Prodi again. This brings us to his election in Parliament. For this term, the Parliament of opted to vote for someone without a controversial political past, which was hard to come by in this period. Berlusconi wanted someone who, unlike Scalfaro, could put this bias aside and do what was best for the nation. It was a sentiment shared by most party leaders at the time, especially on the right. Ciampi seemed the perfect man, and so he won with a sizable majority of 70%. Ciampi is generally judged positively in history for a few reasons. Aside of his wholesome personality, humility and honest love for the institutions, he is credited for restoring faith into the central government and killing the trend of secession and federalism. Furthermore, he restored the original functions of the President of the Republic that had become too involved in the political shenanigans and power, and less with the reputation of the Republic. Pertini, Cossiga and Scalfaro had broken their original institutional functions by abandoning their principles of impartiality and taking sides on politics for reasons that went beyond constitutional matters. Today it is considered a necessary transformation caused by excessive nepotism, systematic decadence and corruption of the First Republic. But now times were different. With the new millennium Italy was a lot stabler, however there was a lot of concern around the figure of the President of the Republic. Scalfaro in 
particular acted more as a president from a presidential system rather than a parliamentary one. Therefore, people sought for normality in Ciampi, which he delivered. Ciampi's last big achievement was to determine Italy's new geopolitical role in the European Union and in a post-Cold War world, something that he was able to achieve thanks to Berlusconi and Prodi, the former operating as prime minister throughout most of Ciampi's term and the latter operating as the president of the European Commission for the first five years. Let's take each of these achievements one step at a time. At the end of the Cold War, Umberto Bossi, together with his newly formed party Lega Nord, revolutionized Italy's political environment by pushing for federalism, decentralization and regional reforms that would have increased regional autonomy in Italy. Bossi's message encouraged division and hostility among the northerners and southerners, which not only meant putting extra salt on a wound that had been open for centuries, but also delegitimized the central government in Rome. Bossi's message message fully resonated with just a small portion of the population, but Bossi had friends in the right places, which allowed him and his collaborators to be nominated in important ministries. Furthermore, the idea of a federal system started to sound appealing also to many other people, both from the left and the right. Ciampi wasn't too keen on federalism, because he saw it as a menace to the constitutional principles of Italian unity, and so he decided to fight the stereotype of the careless central government. He did so in a long series of journeys around the nation. He traveled to every single Italian province, no matter the distance, and there he talked about local issues together with the local mayors or officials. Before every trip, he will study the history and politics of each province, so that he could have a proper conversation with all the communal representatives. His tour around Italy will make him win the support of everyone he came across. This strategy turned out very effective in in fighting parties and sentiments in support of decentralization. Seeing Ciampi so close to the more local territorial issues made many people change their minds about federal governments, something that Bossi certainly suffered from. Another thing he did was valorizing the term patria, which meant homeland, that until slightly before then it had suffered from a negative nationalistic connotation. He taught people to be patriotic democratically without fear and to promote the idea of a united Italy, as well as remembering all the important things Italians did in history. He reintroduced La Festa della Repubblica, Republic's Day, that celebrated the victory of the Republic on the 2nd of June 1946 after the famous referendum. Many national monuments were restored, as well as memorial sites where Italian soldiers were buried. Ciampi also traveled abroad to see where the Italian veterans fought and rested, like in Egypt or Russia. Interestingly, he didn't only praise the partisans, but also the Italians that fought under Mussolini. As Italy was getting over the idea of a federal system, Bossi tried his last attempt to increase regional autonomy in 2005. Parliament passed a constitutional law about regional governments that would have made them more autonomous. However, there was a catch. Unlike normal proposals that just need to win the parliamentary majority to pass and become laws, constitutional laws require two-thirds of the votes, which which this one didn't reach. This left a constitutional referendum as the only option to make the law pass and make people vote. Ciampi, as well as the left, strongly opposed this new constitutional reform. Scalfaro too took a part in the campaign against the law. The results of the referendum turned out negative. This was one of the harshest losses from Lega, from which they never recovered. In his last end-of-the-year speech in 2005, Ciampi will describe his journey around Italy as the most pleasant experience experience of his life, and with that statement many saw the end of Lega's dream of decentralization. Ciampi, unlike his predecessors, had a very hands-off approach to the Council of Ministers. His method was called moral suasion. In politics, moral suasion is an invitation to revise certain choices or behaviors, generally coming from a personality or organism in which authority is unanimously recognized. It is sort of an informal request to reconsider, which Ciampi will do a lot with Berlusconi. This strategy was also used a lot by Enal 
Audi with the Gasberry, and we will see more of it soon. Despite his inexperience, he had a relatively good relation with the first two cabinets he ran into, with D'Alema and Amato, though they were not very liked by the people, and they achieved very little due to the rampant unpopularity the left was experiencing at the time. Inevitably, when the 2001 elections rolled around, Berlusconi made a return, this time with a stronger alliance, so strong that his first cabinet stayed up for a stunning four years, just to be followed with another one that went on until 2006, when the new elections rolled around. To this day, Berlusconi's second government is the longest in Republican history, only rivaled by his fourth government and Crux's first cabinet. Ciampi will quickly find out that there will be little to no way to find common grounds with a media tycoon in power, though he made it work one way or another. Ciampi will constantly stay vigilant towards Berlusconi's actions and will turn out a particularly harsh guardian of the constitution. However, Berlusconi wasn't all bad. For example, he reintegrated the proportional system of assigning seats in parliament, passed some very liberal economic laws that Ciampi approved, and they generally agreed on matters of foreign affairs and economics, though the conflicts definitely outnumbered the agreements. One of the first fights they had was when in January 2002, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Renato Ruggero, resigned because his European views went too much in contrast with Lega's secessionist ideas. Berlusconi decided to take his place for a while before appointing Franco Frattini a year later. Ciampi strongly disliked having Berlusconi into the foreign ministry for reasons that I will discuss later. Another great conflict came when in December 2003, the Gaspari Law was passed in Parliament. It was a law about the media that would have allowed Berlusconi to have more freedom in the field of entertainment. However, Ciampi saw right through it and called it out for its unconstitutional nature. He refused to sign it and so, a few drastic changes were made. It was made illegal for someone to own more than 20% of the media outlets and limiting the amount of ad space companies and parties could buy. This infuriated Berlusconi, as you can imagine, and in a fit of rage, he accused Ciampi of ruining Mediaset, his media company, which was exactly part of the plan. After a long back and forth, it was passed in May 2004. Berlusconi was not the only person Ciampi had a problem with in his cabinet. Minister of Justice Castelli would often fight Ciampi over the jurisdiction reform he wanted to pass, that Ciampi found unconstitutional. They also argued a lot about the presidential pardons. As I mentioned before, the president has the power to pardon criminals as he saw fit, with the cooperation of the Minister of Justice. Sadly, since there was bad blood flowing between Ciampi and Castelli, it became very hard for a president to do one of his most important duties. Another person he did not get along with was Bossi. He even threatened Ciampi at one point that he was going to throw tomatoes at him in parliament if he ever came to visit. Luckily, the conflict never escalated further, and Bossi actually apologized to Ciampi later on. Ciampi was a lot more interventionist when it came to foreign policies, and he was much more open to speak out in the international context. As you can imagine, he was the first president to govern Italy when Euros were introduced, which he was a big fan of. He also had great relations with the EU in general, partly due to the fact that Prodi was president of the European Commission from 1999 to 2004. Prodi was a lot more cooperative with Ciampi than Berlusconi, but by saying this I do not mean mean to undermine the times when, when they saw eye to eye. One of the most important examples was when they witnessed the fall of the Twin Towers, an incident that shocked both to the core. However, when Bush called up Italy alongside the other European countries to join them in the Iraq war, Ciampi was reluctant, seeing the conflict as unnecessary. Berlusconi, on the contrary, was for it. However, Ciampi had to stop him, because the Italian constitution literally forbids the country to go to war unless for self-defense, and since America was the attacker, Italy couldn't join. Berlusconi wasn't too thrilled, but reluctantly 
accepted Ciampi's judgement. Despite Italy's inability of direct contributions to the war effort, Berlusconi still sold weapons to the Americans, so he still got what he wanted at the end of the day. Ciampi was also a strong supporter of the idea of the European constitution, which was talked about a lot in 2005. However, that idea never came to be, partly due to the Lega's opposition to the idea, as well as other nationalistic parties in the parliament. Overall, Ciampi played a big role in European foreign policy, but not too much else aside from that. As Ciampi dealt with Europe, Berlusconi befriended other leaders in other continents. They turned out a great power couple in this sector of nation building. It is thanks to them if Italy is one of the most advanced economies in the world, with allies and connections worldwide. Due to his old age, Ciampi, just like all his predecessors, never really considered a re-election. During this time as senator, he kept working on spreading what he called Republican patriotism and will always oppose Berlusconi and other politicians that favor the simple solutions to complicated issues. Similarly to how Einaudi always complained about the useless political requests from his colleagues that only increased public spending in a wasteful manner, at the expense of of the taxpayers. He will die in 2016 in Rome. Ciampi had left a big mark on the country, which now saw the president again as the guardian of the constitution and the preserver of the power balance in the nation. He had reintegrated Italian unity and the country's reputation worldwide. Well, I hope you enjoyed. I'm sorry if Ciampi's episode wasn't as scandalous or dramatic as Pertini or Scalfaro's, but things have calmed down in this new millennium. Next time we will talk about Giorgio Napolitano, the second last president of Italy. Thank you so much for watching, remember to like and subscribe for more, feel free to also comment uh, to let me know what you think about Ciampi. I will see you next time.